And it tells you why people with ADHD have to focus on scaffolding. You have to put outside of you the things that other people do in here. The, the phrase I like is you have to offload your working memory onto other devices. This invisible dimension of life that we call time is seriously affected by this disorder. And what I like about the executive functioning view of adult ADHD, which you have emphasized, is that it brings with it all of these insights, not just for understanding, but for management, that you wouldn't get if you kept viewing ADHD as an attention disorder. ADHD Rewired, episode number 63. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Check show notes for link. Do you need an easy way to connect with people virtually, but don't want to be hassled by downloads that don't work, connections that are complicated? Go to erictivers.com slash Zoom and check out truly what I think is a revolutionarily easy to use video conferencing platform. That's erictivers.com slash Zoom. Before we get into the interview, I just want to let you know that I'm going to post the video from the Zoom room on this episode's show notes. Just go to ADHDrewired.com, click on podcast, and find episode number 63. The outline and video will be there. And if you listened to last week's episode, you heard that we started a crowdfunding campaign to help raise money for Carolyn Dargenio's seven-year-old son who has type 1 diabetes. I shared on last week's episode that I recently had a client who uh, had died from a, a diabetic coma, and this device that we are trying to raise money for could have possibly saved his life. We're trying to raise $3,000 and you can make a contribution at erictivers.com slash T1D. Without any further ado, let's get into this interview, which I think may be one of the best. I'm kind of giddy, really excited to share it with you. Enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am thrilled to have on the show today, Dr. Russell Barkley. If you don't know who Dr. Barkley is, you might be new to the world of ADHD. Russell Barkley is an internationally recognized authority on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children and adults. He has dedicated his career to widely disseminating science-based information about ADHD. Dr. Barkley is a clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. He's a clinical scientist, educator, and practitioner who has authored, co-authored, and co-edited 20 books. I think that's grown since that was uh, written. Uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and clinical manuals. He has published more than 200 <laughs> scientific articles and books related to the nature, assessment, and treatment of ADHD and related disorders. And I have to say for both myself and speaking on behalf of many other people, um, I view you as a kind of an unofficial mentor because I I study your work. And so I just want to thank you for for coming on the show. And even more so, thank you for everything that you have done for ADHD. Eric, thank you. It's my pleasure. You're kind to say so. So um, we were talking the other day about kind of what what would be the best things for us to talk about on the show. And, you know, you have uh, I first saw you speak and I, I shared the story with you at my very first Chad conference that I went to the conference <laughs> thinking I was this expert in ADHD because I read a couple of books and I have ADHD. Mm-hmm. Um, and you uh, very um, graciously uh, uh, gave me the experience of realizing how much I had to learn. Oh, um, I well. think it was when you presented your theory on 
understand executive functions. I was like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we can start there and talking about executive sure. functioning, because one of the things that you talk about is that you know ADHD is executive functioning deficit disorder and, and executive functioning as a as a uh, construct of self-regulation. So um, just talk to us a little bit about your theory and kind of how you came to uh, to this understanding of sure. ADHD. Okay. I'd, I'd be glad to, of course, a subject dear to my heart, having uh, written several books just on that topic alone. But, uh, And by the way, let me say as an aside that uh, you probably were quite up to date, if not more informed when you attended that meeting compared to other practitioners. But people need to understand that there is between 1,000 and 1,500 articles published every year now on ADHD in the world science journals. I know because I track them weekly. And uh, it, it's just astounding how much information is out there. So please, uh, you know, all of us struggle to stay up to date uh, with this rapidly advancing body of knowledge. But back to executive functioning. Uh, I got interested in this uh, many years ago because uh, being a neuropsychologist by training, uh, it was obvious even to people writing 50, 60 years ago or earlier that the symptoms of ADHD are very similar to the symptoms we see in patients who have frontal lobe disorders, albeit the symptoms are milder than somebody with a frank brain injury, but they're still very, very similar. And so, you know, a, a lot of us have been studying ADHD and its overlap with uh, frontal lobe functions, particularly what are known as the executive functions. And the reason I sort of took this on even more in my research and writing uh, is that after surveying the literature, it turned out that there are more than 25 definitions currently in use on executive functioning, which is not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, because we as a researcher, uh, how, how do you measure it? If you, if yeah, you, absolutely. Right. Uh, and that leads to the second problem that you just mentioned, which is how do you assess it? If everybody's using a different definition, then what people use to assess that definition is going to vary widely, which it does. There are hundreds of tests on executive functioning. And, and a survey of neuropsychologists showed that people ascribe up to 33 different brain functions into this category of executive functioning. And that's just not possible either. So you can see there's mass confusion mm -hmm. when you read about this widely used term. I mean, this has become a fashion trend yes. in research papers. And when you read these papers, you have to be very careful to read what definition they're using. Mm -hmm. And it helps to explain why these papers often disagree with each other mm -hmm. on their findings, whether it's with ADHD or autism or bipolar disorder or even normal development. Um, so that's that's just not a good thing. It just leads to confusion at the clinical level, at the research level, at the theory building level. So, you know, being an ambitious person, I said, I'm going to take this on. And so since 1994, I've been working in this area and trying to develop a theory of it. And the, the way to do that is to start with a concrete operational definition. Mm -hmm. What is executive functioning? And rather than take someone else's definition. I, I started with a trait that virtually every scientist would say, uh, who studies executive functioning, which would, would say is part of executive functioning, and that is self-regulation. Okay, so you started where everyone agrees. Yes, let, let's start there. Okay, and the beauty of that is that we have a very precise definition of self-control given to us many years ago by people like B.F. Skinner, mm -hmm. and later others, Kanfer, Caroli, Mike and Baum, and others who've studied self-control. Uh, and it goes simply like this. Self-control or self-regulation is any action you direct at yourself. It's something you're mm -hmm. doing to yourself, and you're doing it to change your behavior from what it automatically would have been and you're doing that in order to change your future, to change something that lies ahead in and time. And future can be, yeah. you know, in a, in a minute. Right? Uh, a minute, two, five, an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, but in humans, it can be days, weeks, or months. So we're doing something in order to increase or decrease some consequence out there in the future uh, that is probable based upon how we act. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically what we're doing is we're looking out for our long-term welfare, not just our short-term welfare. Um, so that's a very good definition of self-control. Three things, something you do to yourself to change your behavior over what you're doing now, to change your future, to make it better for you. Uh, now, then what I did was to say, okay, an executive function is what you're doing to yourself. 
And if we look at it that way, and by the way, Vygotsky also looked at it that way. Self-speech, right? Yeah, what are you doing to yourself? And you're right, he focused more on self-speech, which is one of the executive functions. But what I did was to steal Vygotsky's idea and to generalize it to all of the executive functions. There are all types of self-directed behavior. And one of them is talking to yourself. But what are the others? So then I said, well, the most common executive functions that virtually all researchers agree on are the following seven. They are inhibition, self-awareness, nonverbal working memory, verbal working memory, emotion regulation, self-motivation, and planning and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And those two tend to go together. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, that's the last one to develop. So what I did then is I took those and I said, all right, let's look at what people are doing to themselves and rephrase these ideas. And when you do that, you begin to realize what people do to control themselves. Uh, first of all, they self-direct their attention, self-awareness. They use self-restraint, inhibition. Now, when, when, they, I, when I read at your, um, yeah. um, <clears throat> some of your work regarding how self-awareness is an executive function, that to yes. me, that was like, oh, that, you know, <laughs> and that put a lot of pieces of this together. Because if you're not aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it, you can't possibly yeah. mo like modify the, your intended no, outcome. You, you absolutely can. That's why self-awareness is step one in executive function mm. and self-control. If you're not monitoring yourself, who cares, <laughs> right? Why would you do anything? Because you don't know that you're doing something wrong that may get you in trouble in the future or that you could be doing it better to make your future better for you. So um, what we tend to see is that the first three that develop together are self-awareness, self-restraint, and visual imagery, which is seeing to yourself. That's the nonverbal system. Yeah, can you and talk a little bit about that? Like, I think a lot of people yeah. get confused about the difference between um, uh, verbal working memory, verbal memory and nonverbal memory. Well, w with good reason, because in traditional studies of those two ideas, people use cognitive tests. And so they use tests that involve words, and that's the verbal working memory. Uh, and then they use tests that involve spatial arrangements for nonverbal. Um, but if you stop and think about what people have to do to perform those tests, they have to talk to themselves to keep refreshing their short-term memory. Uh, Baitley calls that the phonological loop. I, I really wish psychologists would stop using pedantic <laughs> terms because you're just talking to yourself. There's no reason to you know, glorify this. Uh, and the spatial tasks involve visual imagery. And so what people are doing is they're seeing to themselves using their mind's eye and they're talking to themselves using the mind's voice. And that's where we get the verbal working memory systems. And by using these, we are able to sustain information in our mind longer than it ordinarily would be there. We keep refreshing it by doing these things. And that's so, where working memory comes from. So, you know, with like uh, Stephen Covey, who talks about begin with the end in mind. When oh, yes. I, when, when I first heard that, I'm like, that sounds great. How the heck do you yeah. do that? <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, but that's so, what he means. Okay. Yeah. And so I think that's where some of that challenges, those challenges are, is like, oh, how do you begin with the end in mind if you can't actually imagine what that looks like? Yeah. Well, then you can't begin with the end in mind <laughs> because it starts with visual imagery. Can you uh, come up with some hypothetical image of what that would be like. He even, as you point out, and I love his book, by the way, um, I used to tape his seven principles on my mirror in the morning so I could see it every day. And I kept it there for weeks uh, until I had sort of internalized these ideas. I think they're just good principles to follow. But, but back to the point, it's hard to use that principle if you can't visually imagine mm -hmm. that end point. So uh, the, the other uh, executive functions would be self-directed emotion, self-motivation, and planning and problem solving are self-play. They're forms of mental play where we take information apart and recombine it in our mind in order to invent new ideas, overcome obstacles, create multiple options for doing things. But it's actually based on children's play. It's based on manual play. Mm. Uh, I'm not the first person to say that. There's a huge literature showing that adult problem solving is predicated on human play. Uh, so there's your seven executive functions. And all I did to simplify matters is to say that each one of them is something that you're doing to yourself. And now we can understand 
what this is. And now uh, you look at the executive functions as a developmental model, right? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know yeah, that one, uh, one of my, our, my community <laughs> members um, asked the question, um, uh, this is from Doug Harris, who's, a, uh, who's an ADHD coach. Um, he says, I want to know why if ADHD is a result of a delay in the development of the cortex, uh, why, and why everyone doesn't outgrow ADHD once their brain catches up developmentally? Sure. Uh, well, I think um, to answer that point, and then we'll come back to your question, uh, to answer that point is delay doesn't mean lag that's temporary. It can be a permanent delay. Mm -hmm. If you think about mental retardation, now called mm -hmm. intellectual disability, mm -hmm. you think about dyslexia, reading disabilities, those are delays, but they're permanent. Mm -hmm. So the individual is developing at a rate that is below the rate of typical people. They're developing mm -hmm. and they will meet similar milestones, mm -hmm. but they will meet them later. And when the brain finally reaches its maturity, they will level off so below. The, so the ceiling the is level. kind of lower. That's right. the, okay. the, the ceiling okay. is lower. So uh, I think people have to be careful when they use the word delay, not to mean a temporary immaturity, mm but to mean a chronic lag in the development of these mental functions. Now, as with reading disorders, there is a level of executive functioning in adulthood that you have to have to at least make it, to at least be effective. We can call that a functional level. Mm -hmm. And it helps to think about reading. You don't need to be reading at a 12th grade level to function in society, right. but you have to be reading at a sixth grade level and most people would say eighth grade, but at least sixth grade, if you're mm -hmm. gonna fill out forms, read menus, you know, read a newspaper, these are all aimed at about a sixth or seventh grade level. Mm -hmm. That's called the functional level of reading. And if we can get you there, if you have dyslexia, or beyond that, you're probably gonna do okay in life. You're not gonna do great, but you're gonna function. And I think there is a functional level of executive functioning that you have to attain. And if you get past that, even if you don't make it to the normal benchmark, you're still gonna function okay. But if you don't get there, then I think you're gonna be in trouble. Uh, and the problem with ADHD is that many people with ADHD don't get there or get there only marginally or get there only erratically uh, and then they're in trouble. So the brain may be two to three years delayed in its development, and it may ultimately reach a similar size to normal, though that is debatable. But the architecture of the brain, the connections, the neural networks have now been shown to be and to remain abnormal, hmm. even into adulthood. So you, be careful with brain size. That's hmm. not a marker of brain function. Okay. And I know there was, um, speaking of brain size, uh, there were some questions regarding <laughs> brain imagery um, for yeah. diagnosis and treatment. I think there were some yeah. questions regarding, you know, Dr. Amen. What, what, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, well, it, to, to finish our thoughts on executive functioning, let's go back You're to so the question focused. of development, <laughs> and then I'll come back to neuroimaging. But uh, the development of executive functioning, at least according to my model and consistent with other people's views, is that you don't get it all at once. It develops in stages mm -hmm. because it probably evolved in stages. People forget that there were probably between 12 and 20 different human ancestors to current humans. There were different species of humans back then. I don't like the word species, but different, certainly earlier stages of mm -hmm. humanity. And so yeah, each of them probably didn't have all of these executive functions, but we have them all. Uh, and so my feeling is that the first three that develop very early are self-awareness, self-restraint, and visual imagery. Uh, and then followed within five years or more by self-speech, and then later within a few years by emotion regulation, followed by self-motivation, and then ultimately by the time you're an adolescent, you get into the development of problem solving, of planning. Uh, and so there's a staging to executive functioning uh, that, we, that we see in typical people. Uh, and that's important because if the earlier ones are impaired, the later ones will be as well, because they're all built on a pyramid, on a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and because ADHD disrupts the first three very early in life, the others are at risk because of the, they depend on those. Um, so I think that's an important idea as well. Now back to neuroimaging. While neuroimaging studies use 
groups of individuals mm -hmm. and clearly show when you compare groups of ADHD to typical people, we get numerous differences, particularly in five brain areas. Uh, and they're significantly different, anywhere from uh, upwards of 5 to 35 percent difference hmm. in the size of these five regions, uh, at least that level of difference in under functioning in these regions. And it's and not the just the prefrontal cortex we're discovering. No. Now. Well, it, it is largely the prefrontal cortex, but the prefrontal, cor prefrontal cortex projects back to other brain areas. And the areas it's projecting to, like the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, uh, and also the visual cortex of the brain are also underdeveloped in these individuals. And that's, that's a great idea because it conveys to your audience that these are networks. Don't just look at one area, look at their functional connectivity. And in the past five years, modern neuroimaging techniques such as uh, uh, kurtotic tensor diffusion and so on, these are ways of studying how these areas interconnect with each other have shown that the abnormalities in ADHD are even greater than we suspected by just looking at brain volume. The connectivity of the brain is even more disturbed, and, and that's important. Now, back to the question. Why then isn't brain imaging useful for diagnosis? Because the overlap between the ADHD brains and normal brains is sufficient to prevent that kind of use. Hmm. Uh, in order for a clinical test to be useful, the groups you're using it on have to be vastly far apart. Whereas if the distributions of the two groups overlap, and they overlap by about a third, then that means that you're not going to be able to detect that overlap, uh, and your test isn't going to be very accurate. So the usefulness, of, the of, the usefulness of spec scans? Yes, it, uh, uh, spec scans, functional MRI, MRI, but especially spec scanning. Uh, the degree of functional differences between ADHD and normal brains is so subtle that you'll only pick it up by studying groups of people and you average them together. And the averages are what are different. But if you try to classify people, the overlap in these brains and their functioning is so large that you will fail at diagnosis. You will fail at classification. And that's what we see. And that's why everybody working in the field of neuroimaging and ADHD research will tell you these devices cannot be used for clinical practice. It doesn't matter what Dr. Amen says, they can't because the overlap is too great. What happens is you get about a 35 to 50% rate of false, false positives, wow, that's, that's of false negatives rather, meaning that um, people with ADHD will fall in the normal range of brain functioning uh, and you'll classify them as normal when they're hmm. not. Uh, so for that reason, functional neuroimaging at the moment uh, and even structural neuroimaging are not very useful. Now, I do want to hasten to add that the development of these new, very sophisticated, very refined methods for analyzing neuroimaging, such as this tensor diffusion imaging. Yeah, what method, is that? That's something that's new to me. Well, um, what that does is instead of looking at blood flow like spec scanning does to look at functioning, this uses the flow of water. I mean, water is ubiquitous in the hmm. brain, but when water hits certain structures like nerve cells, walls, synapses, and so on, it diverts. And you can actually measure how much water is being diverted or blocked or flowing or prevented. And using very sophisticated mathematics, you can create images from these. Wow. And it's a way of looking at how nerve cells connect to other areas of the brain, how pathways and networks connect. And I, I'm not doing justice to how sophisticated this <laughs> is, but I wanna tell you the images it creates are so refined uh -huh. that you literally can track single tracks, single bundles of nerve cells through the brain and look at where they end and then study how if I stimulate this area, that area activates and vice versa, looking at this functional connectivity. So this is really cutting edge. Uh, and it, what it shows is that what we thought about the brain and ADHD is even more different hmm. than the earlier neuroimaging studies show. The earlier studies looked at size, at volume. There's less brain here, there's less brain there, and so on. And it's delayed in development. The newer ones are actually creating images of these networks and fibers uh, and hmm. these beautiful, almost, you know, you could frame these images wow. as artwork showing that the ADHD networks are not as strong, not projecting to the correct areas. They're projecting to other areas they shouldn't be projecting to. Uh, and 
uh, that's probably underlying a lot of the symptoms. And also what it's showing is that people with ADHD may be developing compensatory networks mm. to, because of this underdevelopment. I mean, if, it's, if it stays underdeveloped for so long, the brain, being somewhat plastic, tries to find different ways to roam, so to speak. So it sounds and, like what you're saying is the ADHD brain is then getting rewired. Yes. All right. It's rewiring during development in order to try to function as well as it can using other routes to these endpoints and these, these various places in the brain. And it partially helps, but it doesn't completely compensate for that. It's, it's, so, it seems like the more we learn, the more we realize how much, very much we are at the beginning of really understanding oh, this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just absolutely fascinating. So expect to see a lot more of these papers on a functional connectivity. If you use Google Scholar, you mm -hmm. can just type that in ADHD and functional connectivity, and you would see many of these studies coming up, and they're absolutely fascinating. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah. So let me ask you a question regarding. So we're going to the kind of the the um, I think the the fifth and sixth stage of your phenotype model of of executive functioning. So the yes. Um, let's talk about time frame because you talk about time horizon and our yes. ability to, to plan. Yeah. So if yeah. we can kind of break it up from kind of 18 to like 30, 30 to five, what th those kind of adult phases of our ability to project into the future. Sure. Sure. Um, what we see, uh, let, let me go back to the seven executive functions and say, mm -hmm. these are the things that are going on in your head. They're hard for people to see late in development. You can see them early. You can see children talk to themselves. Uh, but eventually it disappears. It becomes internal and cognitive in form. Now, those seven cognitive abilities are used together like a symphony to create what we call the five dimensions of executive functioning in everyday life. This is what rating scales measure are these executive functions in daily life activities. And those five are self-restraint, inhibition, as you can imagine, uh, time management, uh, the verbal and nonverbal working memory systems are related to self-organization and problem solving. And then we have emotional self-control and self-motivation. Those are the five things we see in people's daily lives that these seven executive abilities are contributing to. And that's what you're going to see being disrupted by ADHD. You're not going to see the mental disruption. Only mm -hmm. the patient is aware of that. Mm -hmm. But the people around them are going to see profound problems with impulse control, time management, planning and organization, emotional dysregulation and impulsivity, and problems with self-motivation, with the ability to stick with things. Now, as those develop over time, particularly the, self the, the time management one, you're going to see a window on time open in people's behavior. In young children, they're concerned only with the now. They're not concerned about the next moment or tomorrow. As you get into elementary school, children are thinking about 12 hours ahead. As you move into late elementary school, it's a day or two ahead. Teenagers, maybe three to five days, up to seven days ahead. College students, probably one to three weeks ahead. By the time you reach your 30s, you're looking out about two to three months in your life. The average thing you're contemplating in the future lies within that time frame. You are capable of looking further. I said the average thing. Now, this is in typical development? Yes, typical okay, development. Okay. Now, what ADHD is doing is it's slamming that window shut and it's causing about a 40% delay in its expansion. So the person with ADHD is like somebody about 30 to 40% younger in their sense of time and their planning and they're projecting the future, their ability to anticipate the future. Uh, and that is seriously impairing because as you know, life becomes more time sensitive as you grow up and enter adulthood. Uh, and if you're having trouble with time and time management, you're gonna become more functionally impaired in mm -hmm. adulthood than you would have thought in childhood because children don't have to worry about time the way adults do. That is why um, I say in my book that Adult ADHD is the worst disorder you can have with regard to time management. There is no psychiatric disorder as impairing of time as adult ADHD, which is why in my book, as you know, I refer to it as being time blind, yes, time blind, yes. being nearsighted to the future. Mm -hmm. Because ADHD means you can only deal with futures that are close, right. that are imminent, right. as opposed to futures that lie a month or two out. And that explains a lot about 
what ADHD adults focus on and what they do and don't do and why they're not ready when that future arrives, they're in crisis because mm -hmm. they haven't gotten ready for it. And now they're scrambling around trying to cobble something together very quickly to try to deal with this. Sometimes it works. Most times it doesn't. I know uh, for myself when, when I'm going to like conferences, like in my mind, I know that there's all these things that I need to be doing like a couple of weeks ahead of time, but that yeah. information comes to me like the night before. Right. That's right. <laughs> but to other people, it came a week or two or three or eight. You know, a lot of us booked our airline tickets three months ago and we got our hotel and we got our rental car. And all of a sudden, the night before, the adult with ADHD is saying, oh, my God, I haven't registered for this and I don't have a room. And, you know, and then they show up at the conference unregistered and beg to get in. And, you know, we, you obviously know these things. And that's a you know, that's not uh, as important an example as, for instance, your work life. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, if, if you can't manage time, you're going to be fired. Mm -hmm. You're late for work every morning. You don't have your projects ready. The stuff that you needed to do for this particular deadline are not done completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, uh, unfortunately, are not very patient with that. In fact, as Ned Hallowell says, people start to view this aspect of ADHD as a moral failing, as a choice. Mm -hmm. You just don't care. Because if you cared, you get these things done. Whereas we know it's a neurobiological deficit. It has nothing to do with choice and, and moral turpitude. It, in fact, is a serious neuropsychological deficit. But it tells you why people with ADHD, to cope with it, have to focus on uh, what I call scaffolding. They have to put things around them to cope with the timing deficits, the inhibitory deficits, the problem-solving deficits, the emotional and motivational deficits. Mm -hmm. They have to create this structure outside of themselves that helps with their management that other people have internal structure. They have to externalize. And, and you know that's a favorite word of mine when it comes to telling people with ADHD how to cope with it is this word externalize. Absolutely. You have to put outside of you the things that other people do in here. Working right. memory is one we talked about. Uh, you can't rely on mental information to guide you, uh, to, re to help you remember. Right. You need to be using journals and yes. sticky notes and yes. cards Everywhere. and remind your computer and all this other technology. The, the phrase I like is you have to offload your working memory mm -hmm. onto other devices. Right, or outsource it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, outsource it. I I'm, like I'm that. I'm looking at my, my time timer right now. I mean, I have, yeah. I, in my office, there is no spot where I will be looking or, where I don't, do not have a clock in my field yes. of vision. You there know, you go. Right, right yeah. across from the, the chair, my, my clients will sit right above their head is a yeah. clock. So, yeah, I don't, good. so, so good. it looks like I'm looking right at them, but I can also see yeah. the time. I, I love it because that's one of the six things we recommend for executive functioning is you have to externalize information. That's the journals and the notes and everything. You have to externalize time. That's the clock. That's the beeper. That's your Outlook program or your iPad that chimes when schedules are due. So externalize time. You have to externalize your motivation. You have to create extra sources of reward around you, mm -hmm. uh, such as making yourself accountable to other people yes. for what you promise to do. Yes. Create consequences where they don't exist. You have to externalize your emotional control. Ask other people to give you cues as to when it seems that you might be drifting a little bit into higher emotionality, like you're getting a little silly or you're talking too loud or maybe you're starting to show a little frustration. You know, other people can kind of cue you verbally and non-verbally Verbally to help structure that. Uh, and then, of course, the problem solving one, you externalize that by making problem solving manual, by trying to write down the pieces of the problem and then play with them outside of your mind, not just in your mind. Yes. Um, so speaking of problem solving and outsourcing, I do need to take a quick moment to thank my sponsors because I get to outsource the post-production of this podcast, which is detail oriented <laughs> and I don't like that part. So we yeah. will be right back. Zoom video conferencing is so easy to use that with all the extra time I saved not having to configure complicated settings, I recorded this promotion. Support ADHD Rewired and check out Zoom video conferencing. Go to erictivers.com slash Zoom. Again, that's erictivers.com slash Zoom. Get a Zoom room. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to erictivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download 
and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to erictibbers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. The ADHD Rewired 2015 Summer Coaching and Accountability Group is just around the corner. I'm going to do something that I don't think that I've ever done before. I'm going to give you my phone number and invite you to call me if you're interested in being a part of the next ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. Call me and leave a message at 224-993-9450. That's 224-993-9450. Or go to coachingrewired.com. You could send me a message or schedule your free consultation there. That's coaching rewired one word dot com. We start in June. Don't wait. And for you who is listening right now thinking, oh, that sounds great. I'll remember it. I'll, I'll do it later. Yes, I'm talking directly to you. Pause this audio because I'll be here when you get back and write it down. Put it in your phone or do it now. I know you think you'll remember, but we both know what will probably happen. Turning good intentions into actions. Write it down or go to coachingrewired.com or call me at 224-993-9450. That's 224-993-9450. My number and all the links that I just mentioned are in the show notes. Just click on your podcast app, and it will be right there. Now, back to the episode. All right, Dr. Barkley, we are back. Um, so we were just talking about executive functioning, about outsourcing our these kind of cognitive structures of our of our brain. Um, yes. what, one one phrase that I like to use for myself regarding time is that my internal clock never came with batteries, so I make sure all my timers have fresh batteries in them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. In one of my presentations, I show a picture of a typical clock under which it says "typical person." And then a picture of an ADHD clock, and all the numbers are in a pile on the bottom of the clock circle. <laughs> That's it. There's no numbers here. We have no idea what this is. How, however you convey it, people need to know that this invisible dimension of life that we call time is seriously affected by mm -hmm. this disorder. And it's hard. And what I like about the executive functioning view of adult ADHD, which you have emphasized, is that it brings with it all of these insights, not just for understanding, but for management, that you wouldn't get if you kept viewing ADHD as an attention disorder. Right. Uh, calling ADHD an attention disorder trivializes the disorder. It, it disrespects it. It's like Rodney Dangerfield, you know? <laughs> that name gets no respect, whereas EFDD, mm -hmm. Executive Function Deficit Disorder, is a profound problem. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the whole uh you know not getting respect because we you know we yeah. had talked a little bit about the whole notion that you know adhd is not a real disorder adhd is a myth all this all this stuff yeah i know i smile but it's actually very frustrating to deal with it because the the media in particular the mainstream media and our social critics it's not just scientologists although they certainly contribute to this misunderstanding but but even the the mainstream media does as well the new york times has done so many pieces that misrepresent the disorder it's it's a travesty um and i think as you and i discussed earlier uh Although part of this has to do with fringe political and religious groups attacking psychiatry, attacking mental health and, and diagnoses, and especially medication use, mm -hmm. um, some of it, I think, stems from simply the public having a profound misunderstanding about mental disorders. The, the public continues to believe that people's misbehavior is a result of their upbringing, of their parents and their education and their schooling, that it lies outside the person, that it's a socially induced condition. Mm -hmm. And therefore, either it doesn't exist or it's socially caused. And the root causes of the problem lie in parenting and education. And that's where the solutions need to be. Whereas we know that ADHD is one of the top three neurobiological disorders in psychiatry. It's rivaled only by bipolar disorder and autism for the degree to which neurobiological causes, genetic 
and neurological contribute to this disorder. There is no contribution of upbringing to this disorder, but the public thinks that there is. And as long as there is this striking disparity between what the public believes and what science is showing, you'll continue to have stories in the mainstream media attacking ADHD as this social problem, this mythology, when in fact the evidence from more than 20,000 studies now is that we are dealing with a seriously genetic and, and biological mm -hmm. disorder. Until those two views come together, expect to continue to see controversy in the media. But that's why you and I do what we do, which is to disseminate science, to take mm -hmm. the knowledge out there so that at least we fight the good fight against these sources of misunderstanding to try to make people understand the science-based view of ADHD, not the mythology mm -hmm. or the Scientology view. And, you know, and one of the things that I'm, I've am i been over the last couple of years coming to the understanding of is, I mean, the, the science to me is as clear as black and white. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> ADHD it is. is real and I live it every day. Yeah. But I think one of the things that, that I, that, and I've struggled with myself is this in understanding that as, you know, we talk about emotion as a, as a construct in ADHD, yes. that we make decision, decisions based on emotion and oh, not yes. data. So right. how do we take this? the data clearly shows it and right. shift this into something that we can help shift the emotional perspective of the general public who think that ADHD is a myth. Cause it appears maybe that the, the science that the evidence isn't doing it. Um, so what are no. your, what are some of your ideas on how can we shift this conversation in society? Uh, so it, it almost becomes absurd for someone to say that ADHD yeah. Yeah. is not well, real. I think we can take a look at how this happened with other disorders as well. Go back to mental retardation, which previously was viewed as a socially induced condition, uh, even 60 to 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Autism in the 1950s was blamed on cold mothering. Right, refrigerator uh, mothering. And then right. we had the learning disabilities that were being blamed originally for hundreds of years on inadequate upbringing. You just didn't teach your children to read properly. You screwed it up. You know, notice the common theme here. We are very good at bashing parents, particularly mothers, mm. uh, for any ills that befall their children. And we have to stop doing that. That is, that is inappropriate. But if you look at how these other disorders got into public recognition, uh, it took a while. It took anywhere from 10 to 30 years for autism, Tourette syndrome, LD, to finally get the respect that they now get as biological disorders. Nobody blames dyslexia on upbringing, and they damn well better not be blaming autism on upbringing because the, the research is clear. Uh, now, I, I think what they did is they had champions in the celebrity community, in the mainstream media, they had athletes, they had actors, they had TV shows that were dedicated to these disorders, they wove these disorders into the plot lines, and eventually it became common practice that these things were there, they were acknowledged, and they were viewed as neurobiological. ADHD needs to follow a similar path, and although we're trying to do that, it's going to take a while. I mean, mm. it took these other disorders decades, but we're getting there. We have our celebrities. We have Michael Phelps. We have Bubba Watson. We have you know, golfers and athletes like these, but we also have other people in the mainstream media like this, uh, you know, for instance, Ty Pennington from Extreme Home Makeover, mm -hmm. Glenn Beck in the political commentary spectrum. Just Google ADHD celebrities and you will see, or go to Attitude Magazine's website, and you will see these uh, interviews with their parents and how their parents got them to the stage that mm -hmm. they did. I think those are the kinds of things that help to break down these walls of prejudice by using celebrities and by doing what we do, which is disseminating knowledge. And then I think the third thing, I he hesitate to say it, but it's true, is you know, we need to start shaming people who hold these views. Mm -hmm. uh, by shaming them, I mean clearly calling them out for these misguided views. Uh, I mean, it goes back to, we, we used to blame um, you know, uh, homosexuality on parenting. And now look at what's happened. I mean, we have the increasing widespread acceptance of the gay lesbian movement. We have, you know, gay marriage on the agenda now. We have many people believing that these people should, you know, that this wasn't uh, some life choice that you needed to be trained out of, you know, and it's taken them a long time to fight that fight 
of, of shaming people and disseminating knowledge uh, and then using celebrities and others, people who are present in the media in order to help educate the public. And it works, but it takes time. It's very frustrating mm. when you're in the middle of this as we mm. are because it's not moving as fast as you and I want it to move. Well, it's, but it's, it will. it's interesting. Are you familiar with uh, Brene Brown's work? Yes. Yeah. Because you know, she talks a lot about you know shame and, and vulnerability and how you yes, know yeah. sh- shame is this kind of insidious um, uh, you know emotional thing that we we do it and it's it's kind of toxic and yeah. so um, right before I got into starting some of her work um, I there was this uh, a blog post on Psychology Today that was yeah. t- basically talked about how ADHD isn't real and there's and there's zero scientific evidence that is. I know. So I posted a response on there basically, and I and I said I used the words, and I'm thinking back to him, sort of, sort of embarrassed that I said this. I'm like, shame on you, Psychology Today, for even publishing this. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, well, I'm, I, I did the same to Scientific American. Scientific American about oh maybe uh, uh, six months to a year ago, had one of their bloggers write that ADHD was actually creativity in disguise Mm. and that if we treated it, we were going to see a reduction in creative people. Uh, This is insane. There is no evidence for this. And, you know, here we have one of the premier popular science magazines in the world having one of its bloggers state what is clearly the least scientific view I can imagine uh, about this that does real harm to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so I did write, as you did, you know, shame on you. And then I went through and tore apart the commentary showing that even the articles he he was referencing had been misreferenced, intentionally, by the way, Mm. misreferenced. Uh, mm. And when he was called out on it, he simply said, oh, well, that's OK, because my point is still valid anyway, even though the evidence I marshaled was not correct. You know, it, mm. it, it's it's very frustrating. I but think I think that, this is what we have to do. I think that you had said at one time that, uh, you know, ADHD is kind of the whipping boy of psychiatric yes. disorders. Yes, it is. It's the Rodney Dangerfield, uh, <laughs> which actually makes it sound funny when, in fact, it, it really isn't. Uh, yeah. it, it just doesn't get the respect. I'd like to see the disorder renamed. That's not going to happen. I think the name in part is uh, is part of this trivializing of the disorder. It makes it sound like all you have to do is go to Starbucks and get a coffee yeah. and you'll be just fine. Whereas if you viewed it as a self-regulation disorder, I mean, that's a profound disorder. And speaking of, uh, of names and renaming in the, in the clinical literature, there's a the the other ADHD or or the inattentive ADHD, which has been yes. called sluggish cognitive tempo, right. um, SCT, and you're also suggesting a, another name for it. Will you yes. just talk a little bit about what SCT is? What you what you're recommending as a new name for it? Well, yes. I mean, people who follow my, my sort of research and work know this is my more recent passion at the moment. This, along with uh, emotion being part of ADHD and not some separate thing from it, uh, which we can talk about if you wish. But um, we have known since the 1980s that there is a subset of people with attention problems who don't look like ADHD. Originally, we called them ADD without hyperactivity, but then we got rid of that term when DSM-4 and DSM-5 came out. Um, But we've known for quite some time that there's a subset of people who have a set of symptoms that don't look like ADHD at all. And yet they're being put into the ADD, ADHD category because it's the only attention disorder. So if you have an attention disorder, this must be where you Mm -hmm. belong. Uh, When in fact, researchers have been looking at these people separately. Uh, And eventually the term in 1986 was coined by Ben Leahy and his students, sluggish cognitive tempo for the name of this dimension of inattention. Mm -hmm. And just briefly, it consists of staring, daydreaming, this sort of pensiveness, um, this uh, kind of a sleepy, sluggish appearance, but sort of being inwardly preoccupied, slow moving, sluggish. Uh, This pattern called sluggish cognitive tempo uh, is not correlated with ADHD to any great extent. Uh, and is distinct from it in in many ways. And so we began to study people with SCT. And there's now probably about 60, 70 publications, good science papers uh, on the disorder and growing, by the way, weekly now that people have caught on to this. Um, 
but it's a very different disorder. For instance, ADHD is linked up with uh, conduct problems, uh, substance use, as you know, uh, difficulties with uh, uh, anger and hostility and sometimes aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, SCT has no link to that. SCT is linked more to depression and anxiety. Um, we know that ADHD people are very uh, outspoken, talkative, engaging, uh, even, overly so, in fact, whereas people with SCT tend to be reticent, shy, reserved, quiet. There are many of these kinds of differences between these two disorders. So uh, a couple of things that have happened in the last five years. First of all, I and others have now done national surveys documenting that SCT is as prevalent as ADHD, both in children and adults. It's about 5% of the population. That SCT is different than ADHD in terms of Could its impairment. There's about a 50% overlap, but then well, there's also... just about to get to okay. that, that, that. And we've also realized they can be comorbid, which in the old view, you either had ADHD or you had ADD. In the new view, you can have ADHD and SCT, but half of the people don't. They have their separate disorders, okay. uh, but half of them do. And by the way, what we showed across the lifespan is when these two disorders coexist, they are far, far more impairing than ADHD is by itself. Uh, that each disorder brings with it its own impairments and they're additive. Uh, and that's a very important idea because some of what we see in severe ADHD is the fact that you've got two attention disorders, not mm. one. Uh, now, back to this change in label, it's a very important point. Uh, researchers coined this term more than 30 years ago because it wasn't a clinical diagnosis and they didn't give much thought to how patients would receive it. But over the past five or six years, my students and, and others, we've been introducing this to patients. And I can honestly tell you that people hate this name and well, they should because it is pejorative, it is derogatory, it is demeaning. And, and as they will tell you, it implies that I'm stupid, that I'm mentally, intellectually slow. And we don't mean to imply that. So a year ago, I wrote an article for a science journal that uh, I think is getting some play among my colleagues, encouraging them to rename this as concentration deficit disorder. It's benign. It uses a name that's different from ADHD, whereas calling this ADD is, creates confusion. ADD mm -hmm. is the old name for ADHD. So I, I don't know if you're just out of date when you use it or if you're referring to this group of people, mm -hmm. whereas CDD hasn't been used for anything else. It implies that there's a problem with concentration, shows there's another attention disorder, but carries no derogatory baggage mm -hmm. that is offensive to people. And, and so I think you're going to see this term used more and more. I certainly used it in my textbook that was published in January, the fourth edition of my handbook. And I'm trying to encourage people so that we don't, you know, get on this tangent of using offensive terms mm -hmm that eventually patients are going to reject. Mm -hmm. so, hmm. When I first heard you talk about this and, and when you, when you talk about the staring, my first thought was, yeah. Oh crap. That. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I mean, I sometimes get in this like gaze where I'm just like, where I know I'm doing and I can't even avert my attention away from just being like spaced out. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, I'm right. semi aware, aware of it. But then you also talked about how it's consistent and where we know yes. ADHD, the one thing that's consistent about it is it's inconsistent. Yes. That's right. It's highly variable. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, and, but your point is well taken. Everybody has some SCT like traits. We, we all periodically stare. We all engage in mind wandering. Uh, we all have trouble with daydreaming sometimes. Right. So if I'm driving to work and it's boring, I start to think about other things and I miss the turn to the parking garage. That's a good example of all of us having a little SCT CDD. Right. All of us engage a little bit in mind wandering. The, the point is when this becomes pathological, when every time you're engaged in some primary activity that isn't very interesting, your mind starts to wander away and that mind wandering comes back to interfere with what you're doing, you've crossed a line into the disorder category. Uh, you are experiencing impairment in major life activities from this. And that's where the disorder begins. And, and I want to talk a little bit um, as we're kind of, we have about nine minutes left here. Okay. Um, 
about you know the functional impairment and how yes. ADHD really can be you know it's it's it I view ADHD as very much of a spectrum disorder um, yes, it can be it, it can be mildly impairing it can be severely impairing yes. and we know that ADHD often travels with friends meaning other uh, coexisting disorders yes it does um, yeah. So I know that you know part of of your kind of thing passion for ADHD does come from a very personal place. Um, well, yes, it and does. Yeah. You you had lost your your brother who had pretty severe ADHD. Would, would yes, you mind Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm happy to talk about it just because it it makes what was a senseless death hopefully have some meaning and maybe other people can benefit from it. Um, I have a, a or had a, a fraternal twin brother, Ron. Uh, who uh, was, has been severe ADHD with learning disabilities uh, going back uh, well into our preschool years. Before Ron was five years of age, he had at least three or four life-threatening accidental injuries, mm. ran in front of cars, dove into lakes that were only four feet deep, hitting his head, mm. lacerated himself, practically set fire to our home, playing with matches and mm. things like that. Uh, I mean, Ron was very, very ADHD. Uh, and you know, it, he, he was a great guy. He was a funny guy. He was very active and talkative. And, uh, but he was very, a uh, very poor student. And eventually he left school at 16 years of age uh, to pursue uh, rock music and became a, a, a very gifted rock musician, mm -hmm. played with hundreds of bands all over the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, always waiting for that big break and that next American Idol moment or something, which unfortunately never came. But if you watched him play, I would liken him, uh, I think, quite honestly, to people like Stevie Ray Vaughan, Eric Clapton. Wow. I mean, he you literally could see him channeling music as as he played. Uh, but he's very good, but his impulsiveness and his risk taking and his poor organization and his emotions always got the best of him. So unfortunately his relationships with his wives didn't last very long or with his, his three children. Uh, and, uh, he would engage in a lot of risk taking behavior. He always drove without seat belts, always speeding, always using alcohol more than he, he should have as is typical in the music community, drugs become a serious part of life. He was in and out of jail from time to time for drug possession, nothing violent, but certainly uh, the use of drugs. And so eventually in his 50s, unfortunately, um, Ron was just out uh, driving one of the back roads in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. But, you know, he was going 40 on a 25 mile an hour dirt mountain road, wasn't wearing a seat belt, and unfortunately um, just caught the wheel of the car in a ditch and overcorrected and rolled the vehicle and was thrown out of it and it rolled on him and killed him instantly in a very, very sad moment mm. in our lives. But, you know, it just illustrates the life threatening nature that this disorder can have, not just with regard to drug use, but with regard to you know poor diet, poor health care, poor nutrition, and then on top of that, the connection between ADHD and driving uh, risks is very strong. Uh, ADHD is the worst disorder you can have actually and operate a motor vehicle uh, and and Ron was a classic case of that and uh, eventually it it caught up with him. He was in and out of treatment. there were times he was willing to get treated. there were other times he denied that there was any problem and therefore stopped treatment. This happened to have occurred in, in one of those times when he was not mm. in treatment. So uh, very, very sad to see this uh, highly uh, creative musician uh, you know, end his life at uh, 56 years of age mm. through a very trivial single car accident that was preventable. I'm very sorry for your loss, man. That's, yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. And I, I, when I first read that in the back of, uh, of taking charge of adult ADHD, it was, yeah. I was glad that you put that in there because I think it makes it very um, real. And, and I hope that it serves uh, to forewarn others that this is a disorder that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, it's one of the most impairing outpatient disorders that you and I see. Uh, it more impairing than depression, anxiety, learning problems, relationship issues, because it interferes with almost every major area of life, including life expectancy. We now 
have studies to show that people with ADHD are three times more likely to die before the age of 46, mm. and that their life expectancy is probably going to be shortened by a number of years, uh, anywhere, my guess would be seven to 15 years or more, if it isn't treated. Uh, it's a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Uh, uh, we've already mentioned accidental injury, drug use, probably cancer, uh, because all of them come back to this underlying problem with self-regulation. Uh, and self-regulation problems are the single uh, biggest cause of mortality. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. For sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I, I do see behind you, is that a bass guitar? Yes, it is. Do you play? Uh, I, I've gone back to it because, um, speaking of my brother, uh, when he left school to uh, learn rock music, uh, I didn't leave school, but my older brother took up the drums and I took up the bass guitar and we played in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area for a number of years while I was in high school and early college. Uh, in fact, you can read the history of rock and roll in the D.C. area called, um, uh, I believe, Capital Rock is the name of the book. And in there, you'll see our band being mentioned as contributing to the history of rock and roll. But I played in the Georgetown bars and the campuses of the colleges and at the military bases. And so uh, a number of years ago, actually, it was the year my brother passed away uh, to help with my grieving. Um, and I'm going to start tearing up here. My wife uh, of 46 years, uh, who I've known since high school, went out and bought me a bass guitar and uh, said, I think you need to get uh, back into this. Uh, and uh, so, yes, that's what you see. And I play around with it, what I call karaoke bass, <laughs> and, uh, play to the old 60s and 70s rock songs. So I have a good time with it. Well, maybe at, at some uh, meeting at some point in the future, you know, I, I play keyboard and piano. So oh, my goodness. Yeah. maybe at some point you and I can have a little jam session. Well, and we'll get Sam Goldstein who plays lead guitar and Mike um, Gordon also plays a very good guitar and not to mention other instruments as well. So, you know, I, I think we're on to something here. <laughs> that would be incredible. <laughs> so, you know, now that we're kind of ending the, uh, the show here, I do want to just leave a, a few moments for the random question round. This yes. is the part of the show that has nothing to do with ADHD, which yes. then paradoxically has everything to do with ADHD. <laughs> yeah. Are yeah, you ready? Yeah. All right. So if you can ha uh, come up with an invention or an improvement upon a certain uh, uh, product out there, what would it be? Oh my goodness. Oh, that, that's tough. Um, what, what would it be? Uh, I, you know, you've, you've put me to shame here. It would probably be uh, taking, you know, technology like the Apple Watch or other things uh, and uh, reprogramming it for uh, self-regulation. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, now, I think I might actually know the answer to this question now, but maybe not. Okay. Um, if you were to enter a talent show, what would right. your talent be? Oh, I think you saw it in the background. I, I, I certainly can't sing. My brother has never let me near a microphone. I was one of the few who had no voice. So certainly it, it would be uh, that uh, that instrument. Yeah. So it certainly wouldn't be uh, golf or sports. <laughs> okay. Um, what animal freaks you out the most? Oh, my goodness. Uh, not many, but um, probably... Um, sudden movement of things like uh, you know maybe uh, snakes and spiders once I see them I'm fine with them but I think it's just sudden motion so there was a great podcast episode on a, of a podcast called Invisibilia uh, yeah. NPR which actually talks all about the the movement of snakes and and yeah. you know it's because it's like unexplainable to our mind in some ways on why, why yeah. that is um, yeah, well, I actually, uh, since you mentioned that, one that, that does occasionally freak me out, though I'm a little more rational about it, um, are, uh, are bees, especially stinging bees, because I uh, nearly died when I was eight years old from falling into an underground huge nest of yellow jackets. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, suffered uh, cardiac arrest and had to be resuscitated and everything. So uh, to this day, I still have occasional uh, nightmares. <laughs> I, bet about... the, I, I bet your cortisol is flooding you when you see oh, some bees. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me ask you one last question. Sure. Um, nutritional value, kind of irrelevant on this. Yeah. If 
every meal had to be the same from now on, what would you eat? Uh, I would eat steak. You did say. I, I, think... I would eat steak. I tell you, I come back to that two or three times a week in some form or another. But I am definitely a carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you like yours cooked? Oh, I cooked one last night. We did uh, filet mignons on mm. the grill. I cook them for about three to four minutes on the grill to sear them with a little olive oil and Italian seasonings and some sea salt. Uh, and then I finish them off in the oven for about eight to ten minutes. And I like them about medium rare. And that and a bottle of red wine and some grilled veggies on the side. Man, that is to die for. <laughs> well, uh, if, if I might end this by calling you Russ and just saying, Russ, anytime you're in Northern Illinois, you have an open invitation to come out to, to Volo, which is a small town out here in Northern Illinois. Yes, and, I'll, I and I will make you a steak just the way you like it. Eric, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Russ, can you tell people how they can reach you and kind of find more information about you? Uh, the best way is through my uh, my two websites, uh, russellbarkley.org, that's R-U-S-S-E-L-L-B-A-R-K-L-E-Y.org. And my other website, to which I've posted about 35 hours of my lectures since I'm gradually moving into retirement now, is ADHDlectures.com, and they're free. Uh, so those two websites will get to the information you need to know. Well, thank you so much for spending the hour with me and for everything that you have done and are, are continuing it's to do for ADHD. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was so incredibly fun for me. I, uh, we, we know with ADHD, we sometimes call it the disorder of good intentions. And I want to tell you that I, uh, over a year ago when I first started my podcast, I had, I kept thinking about, man, how awesome would it be if I could get an interview with Dr. Russell Barkley? And, uh, man, I, I, my only regret was that I didn't ask him sooner. Um, so I, I want to thank, uh, personally, Carolyn Dargenio, who, um, who helped me craft my email to, uh, to Dr. Barkley in, in asking him, uh, to be on the show. I also want to, uh, thank Meredith, Deshaun, Rich, um, Doug, Donna, um, and, uh, Virginia and, and Colleen for submitting questions, uh, and, and, uh, and Jenny for submitting questions, uh, for me to ask. I didn't get to all of them, but I did get to a, a few of them. Uh, so I, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I am, I'm kind of having that, my, my, the, my facial muscles or, or facial, my, fa you know what I mean? Are hurting from smiling so much. I just got off the, the interview with him. That was a lot of fun. But that's all the time we got. So until next time, cue the outro music. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. If you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with links and other resources mentioned at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors, erictivers.com slash zoom and erictivers.com slash audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the search portal at ADHDrewired.com. You can also help support this podcast by leaving an honest review in iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget, hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the community. ADHD Rewired is on Facebook. You can like our page, but submit your request to join our free and growing community. We are almost at 200 members. And please check your other inbox because I screen everyone before they come into the group. Speaking of groups, ADHD Rewired Summer Coaching Groups are now forming. Schedule your free 20-minute consultation with me at coachingrewired.com. If you're looking to get a better handle on time management, project management, and productivity while being connected to a group of like-minded people who all support you and genuinely understand your challenges, join the next ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. We begin in June 2015. There is a reason why 8 out of the 12 members of our last group requested an extension group, and that group is starting this week. 
Go to coachingrewired.com to complete the interest form or to schedule your free consultation with me. That's coachingrewired.com. Do you have a question or comment that you want to be played on an upcoming episode? Go to speakpipe.com slash ADHD rewired and leave a message from your computer or from the SpeakPipe app. I want to thank you for donating to the Not Another 1 in 20 campaign that we launched during last week's episode. Recently, a young adult client of mine died from a diabetic coma, and in honor, we are raising money to help Carolyn Dargenio's seven-year-old son, who has type 1 diabetes, get a device that would alert his mom if his levels are too high or too low. This device could have saved my client's life. We are raising $3,000 and your contribution can help. Go to ericktibbers.com slash T1D for a link to make a donation. And thank you. And thanks again for listening. And don't forget, it takes courage to do things that are hard, but the things that are hard are always worth doing. Until next time.